appreciate Pastor Matt asking me to fill in for him. I always tell him it's a good deal because it always makes you look a lot better when you get back here on a Sunday morning. So, uh, no, they're enjoying their time off, Pastor Matt and Kyla. And pastors need some time off from time to time. It's a big responsibility to pastor a church. And your pastor, Pastor Matt and Kyla, do it very, very well. They are exceptional pastors. You are blessed to have Matt and Kyla and their family here at Green Bay First Assembly. What this church is doing in this community is unprecedented amongst churches. It really is. You, it could be so easy to get used to listening to Pastor Matt and things that you're doing and passing out food and these kind of things. It's an amazing outreach. It's an amazing ministry. Keep praying and believing and keep doing what you're doing. It really is having an incredible impact on this community. How many of you have your Christmas decorations up yet? Yeah, quite a few. How many started right after Halloween? <laughs> How many do not have your Christmas decorations up yet? Okay. Looking at about half and half, I think. So, anyway, the title of the message this morning is Where Does Christmas Start? I want you to pray this prayer after me. Father God, I declare by faith that my mind is prepared. My heart is ready, and my spirit is excited to receive your word, Jesus' name, amen. So you said that you are excited in your spirit to receive the word. So when you, <laughs> when you hear the word this morning, remember that. So uh, this is going to be an interesting opening scripture titled, The Message, Where Does Christmas Start? I want you to take a couple of deep breaths, get some oxygen into your brain, and stick with us here. Don't fall asleep. Jeannie's going to come and read this challenging opening scripture from Matthew chapter 1. Jeannie, come and read that for us this morning. Reading from Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amadinab, I knew I would goof that up, Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, 
the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Didn't you do an amazing job? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Exciting portion of scripture. So a word of prayer. Father, you are truly awesome. When I read your word, when we read your word, we know how much that we can trust you. Lord, out of a genealogy of people who were just like all of us. And you named them just like you named us. And it's a precious thing, Lord, that you know us, that you care about us, that you created us. There's power in you, Father God, power in your creation. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that through this word this morning, you give us power, strength, grace, and liberty. Free us, Lord, by your word to accept your word and apply your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeannie. That did an awesome, awesome job. Someone said the only thing special about Joseph was his bloodline. And, you know, we're going to find out this morning just how special that really is. Why in the world would a preacher have his wife read a tedious, boring genealogy for a Christmas message? I mean, if you're going to give a message on Christmas, why not the angel appearing to Zechariah? Or the angel appearing to Mary, that's a, a really exciting one. Or Mary and Joseph trudging down the dusty road to Bethlehem, that's a wonderful story. Or maybe the shepherds uh, appearing, uh, or the angels appearing to the shepherds out on the, on the hillsides. Or at least, at least the wise men coming from the east to look for the Christ child. I told someone a few weeks back I was going to be speaking this Sunday from the Genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, it was all they could do to stifle a yawn. Boring. But friends, don't despair. Don't give up this morning. Stick with me, because i got some fantastic news to tell you this morning. And it's all contained right here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And like everything else in the New Testament, it's telling us something important about meanings. And it gives us important clues about the meaning of Christmas. And even more, it gives us clues as to where the Christmas story really starts. And maybe more importantly than that, who is going to carry that on today? I think this is not just a biological genealogy. I think it's a spiritual genealogy. Matthew is not just trying to prove or show genetic succession. He is telling, I believe, an incredible story to us. So if you were to ask, where does the Christmas story start? Well, you might say something like, I think the start of hope, the start of Jesus probably began at 2 o'clock in the morning in Bethlehem of Judea, December 25th in the year 1. Or maybe maybe the start of hope began in Matthew 121, where it says, she will bring forth a son, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew begins even earlier than that. He starts at the beginning of a great story. He starts with Abraham, as you saw in the opening scripture this morning. He follows the promise that God gave to Abraham and his descendants to be a light to future generations and tells of those who for thousands of years carries the promise and how the promise comes together and finally materializes at the manger in Bethlehem. He chooses names, names that tell the story of the people, names that bring hope for a new world. Hope for you. Hope for me. Hope for Green Bay first. You see, people at the time were desperately looking for hope, and they're desperately looking for hope today. They were desperately looking for justice. And this story not only points to the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, but you look at this story and it points a lot further down the line than that, way past the first coming of Jesus Christ to when he is coming again and he will rule the world, the Bible says, for a thousand years. That church will be the real culmination of hope in the scripture. And it says in Isaiah eleven six, at that time, the wolf will also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. What a great time. 
that's going to be. Those who were in Christ, no separation because of intellect, no separation because of race, whether you were Palestinian or Jewish or black or white, but if you were in Jesus Christ or are in Jesus Christ, all will be one. And What a great thing, church, that's going to be, isn't it? What a great time that's going to be. But what Matthew does is marches right down through Israel's history, right to Bethlehem, to the Christmas hope for all the world. And that hope, friends, you and I know, is Jesus Christ. And he puts incredible, marvelous little twists and ironies in the story. It is not a tedious, boring story. I want you to take a closer look at the names. <clears throat> We're going to do that this morning. Can I have the water there, Jeannie, on the floor there? <clears throat> When I used to preach every Sunday, I never had a problem with that. <laughs> Thank you. I want you to consider that list this morning, if you have your Bible in front of you. We're going to look at the genealogy. They, they read like a bunch of eye-straining, unpronounceable male names, and <clears throat> I thought Jeannie did a marvelous job in reading those names. And by the way, if she missed one or mispronounced one, could you tell? I couldn't. You look down the list and you see the names of four women. Let's touch bases with them for a few minutes this morning. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite, whom we all know to be Bathsheba. Friends, listen to me this morning. Those women are going to add some spice to your Christmas punch here this morning. They really are. Take Tamar, for instance. She did something absolutely taboo in her time and in ours. She connives to bear a son with her own father-in-law. See, Tamar is the story of a dysfunctional family and a father-in-law's failure to do his responsibility. <clears throat> in short, Judah, father-in-law, doesn't produce a husband for Tamar when her first husband dies. And then the next husband fails to consummate the marriage. Third son is given to somebody else, and Tamar is left without children. But even more important than that, for Matthew, Judah is left without grandchildren and the promise to Abraham to be the light of nations is about to die. So Tamar does what she believes, for God's sake, she has to do because Judah doesn't fulfill her responsibility and she connives a plan in Genesis 28 and it's a dark story. It's also powerful. She disguises herself as a prostitute. She goes out by the road and Judah, her father-in-law, who's no winner, by the way, sees her, doesn't recognize her. She has a veil, sets up an appointment with her. And she says, what will you give me for this appointment? He says, I'll give you a young goat. She says, how do I know that she'll do that? He said, I'll give you my signet ring and my staff. And he does, and they get together, and the next day he sends the goat out with the servant. She's not there. Following day, he sends a servant out again with the young goat, and she's not there. And three months later, I think the family kind of took some kind of nasty delight in coming to Judah and saying, Judah, guess what? Tamar is pregnant. And oh, they're so righteously indignant. And Judah says, Tamar, you have to die because the law says you need to be stoned. And she's going to die, and they bring her in. And I want you to get the picture this morning. They're ready to stone her in their place of righteous indignation. And she says to them, by the way, the father of this child is the one who owns this ring and this staff. And boom, Judah is caught right in the middle of it all. And maybe to his credit, he says, she has been more honorable and more honest than I have been. Nine months later, she bears a child through what the law might call incest. Incredible. Listen to this. According to Matthew, Tamar keeps the promise alive because of her courage, because of her daring, and centuries later, the fulfillment of the Bethlehem promise. Church, Tamar and her kind might not be the kind that you put in your genealogy or brag about to people, but for Matthew, Tamar and her courage are crucial to sustaining the Christmas promise. You dump Tamar, you dump the Christmas story as we know it. Well, let's go to Rahab. Okay? 
She's not a prostitute in disguise. She's the real thing. It's what she does for a living. But when Joshua was about to enter the promised land and he sent the spies to Jericho, something in her spirit sparks something and she welcomes the spies. She hides them and she lies to the soldiers about their whereabouts and she sends them off on a wild goose chase. Consider this. She's a foreigner. She's an alien. She's an outsider. She's a tainted woman. And now she's a traitor to her own people. Listen, church, like when you and I got saved or get saved, and maybe even today, when confronted by the reality of the presence of God, the word says about Rahab, by faith she believed. Everyone say she believed. She believed by faith, and her faith stands as a shining example down through history. And Paul, in his writings, is so impressed by her that he puts her in the great hall of faith in the book of Hebrews. She received hope by her faith and belief in God. Hebrews 11.31, by faith, everyone say by faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. She heard and she believed. The Spirit sparked something within her. Do you understand what it says in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would do what? Believe. She believed and she received the spies with peace. And James the apostle is so impressed that he also includes her in his book. Not your usual heroine in the gallery of genealogy, friends. But in Matthew, she is the forbearer of Christ and she saves the promise. And without Rahab, no Christmas story as we know it. But what about Ruth? A little further down the line, an astounding story of a very odd union between a man and a woman. Again, a despised outsider, an idol worshiper by heritage who leaves her country with her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, And she's widowed as well. She goes off to a foreign country, Israel, which she doesn't know anybody. They're very, very poor. And you remember, right, the famous line, sometimes it's in weddings that she gave to her mother-in-law, where you go, I'll go. Where you reside, I'll reside. Your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Well, that's easy to say before you make the trip. But now they're there. And the reality comes to bear. They are poor. They have nothing. There's no Green Bay First there to help them out. There's no food lines or bags of groceries or anything like that. She has to go in the fields and pick up whatever grain is left over from the harvesters to survive. And she's out there one day, and a man by the name of Boaz notices her. And I mean, he notices her. (laughs) Believe me, church, for him, it was love at first sight. Any of you men believe in love at first sight? Any of you women believe in love at first sight? Well, I guess I do, but I don't believe in marriage at first sight. Love at first sight, maybe. What about, I read about a wedding rehearsal. See, there needs to be something that goes into a relationship before marriage takes place. Can someone say amen to that? During the wedding rehearsal, the bride-to-be grew very nervous about that walk down the church's extremely long middle aisle. Mother said, don't worry, dear. You can get rid of any last-minute jitters if you concentrate on three words. First, when you get ready to, to come down the aisle, just be thinking about all the times you came down there as a young girl to pray at the altar. You came down that aisle to, to give your life to Jesus Christ. Think about that when you're coming down. Think about that beautiful aisle. And then, said when you're, when you're coming about halfway down, you look up and you see the altar of God. And you think of the times you prayed there as a young girl growing up. Just think about that altar. It's a beautiful thing. And then when you get close, you see those men lined up there and you look at your husband-to-be and you say, that's him. Him, that's the guy. So 
So on the wedding day, the mother's advice worked like a charm, and she was nervous, and she's coming down the aisle, and she's thinking, wow. Then she sees the altar, and then she sees him. And she says to herself, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. That's why you need premarital counseling. Because I guarantee you, you will not alter him. <laughs> and he will not alter you. All right, love at first sight, back to Boaz. He takes out some extra grain and he says to his men, leave extra for her. And don't you dare harm her in any way. And she's astounded and she tells her mother-in-law what happened, that brave, wise mother-in-law of hers. And so she devises a great plan to get her introduced to Boaz, and it works, and they get married, and Boaz redeems her in the biblical sense of the word in terms of children uh, in, in Israel, and the Christmas hope is carried on because of Ruth's devotion to God. To her mother-in-law, she becomes the grandmother of King David, the one who sets the hope and the course for the Christmas story. No Ruth, no Christmas story, as we know it. Well, how about Bathsheba? The Bible says, the one who was the wife of Uriah. Well, we know that's Bathsheba. You know the story, don't you? It's not a good story. King David commands her into the palace. Guys are out fighting in the front. He's home, and they commit adultery. She gets pregnant. David plots to get her husband killed. They get married. The child dies. Later, she has another child by the name of Solomon. And just when it looks like a usurper is going to take the throne away from him, she intervenes, Bathsheba does. And in an incredible way, she does it with David for Solomon, for the Christmas promise as we know it. Without Bathsheba, you can kiss the Christmas story goodbye as we know it, friends. And listen, the men involved in this story are not cut from a different cloth than these women are. They're not. Judah is a prideful, self-righteous man. Jacob, crude, crafty, conniver, liar, schemes with his mother to steal the birthright from his brother, deceives his father. Even King David becomes a cynical politician, an adulterer, a murderer, a liar. Listen, we've got here a clique of ancestors that most of us would slam into the closet and close that door forever. These are names that would push the Kardashians right off the pages of the National Enquirer. Or maybe today, right off the pages of our own newspapers. Not the kind that we would brag about, certainly. What's going on here? What's Matthew doing? He's telling us, church, that the promise of Christmas makes its way through some pretty rough landscapes. It comes to us in all two human hands. It's not immune from the traumas or the ironies or the tragedies that you and I face in our lives. It comes because the promise is born on the shoulders and the sufferings of the winners and losers in the world. No sentimentality, no fairy tales, no fantasy characters here. Matthew's crowd sounds more like some people that we might know. Maybe like some people that we are. What a parade, this gang, who bore the Christmas promise to save the promise, to save the message, brings Christmas to fulfillment. Who was it that said, God writes straight with crooked lines? So true. Yeah, the next set of names, kings and prophets, monarchs like the, the likes of Rehoboam and Asa and Jehoshaphat and Manasseh. Yeah, some of them more or less good, some of them corrupt, some of them incompetent, some of them such failures that ultimately the children of Israel are taken off to a foreign land to be under the tyrannical rule of foreign rule. Uh, leaders and kings. Satan trying every step of the way to stop the Christmas story. Would it end there? In a foreign country? Under foreign rule? No, because God can use foreign countries. God can use heathens. God can use political situations. God can use people who have no desire to be used. If you understand anything about the history of Christianity, he can even use churches. Isn't that amazing? What are great implications for us? Matthew's alert to this type in his genealogy. 
churches out there that call Jesus Lord, churches like Green Bay First, God can bear and present and carry the Christmas message through this church, through you, through all of our ups and downs and all of our humanness and all of our failures and all of our inabilities to grasp what God really wants to do and where he is at. God looks down at you and says, if you are open to God, if you are willing, if you'll say like Mary did when confronted by the angel, Lord, whatever you say, I'll do. He'll use you. And you'll be a part of carrying on that beautiful story. Believe in Live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Catch the vision of that power and that passion. And God will use you in some incredible ways to reach those who are in darkness today and dying in their sins. He will use you if you will be used to carry on the Christian or the uh, Christmas story. He can and he will. Remember what Moses said? Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I have disabilities. I can't be used. Mary said, me? I'm the least of the the ones you should be using. No, God uses anybody who will open up their hearts and their minds to him. Well, the last crowd. And you know what? This is the crowd that I'm really most impressed with. I really am. Abayud, Eliakim, Azor, Zadak, Achim, Eliad. Eleazar, Mathan, Jacob, the father of Mary's husband, Joseph. You know, why, you know why that's such a terrific group of names? Because every other name that's given is found in another place in the Bible. But these names don't appear anywhere else. These are the anonymous of their time. These are the nobodies. These are the people that never get written up. They're the ones that bear the Christmas promise day by day, moment by moment. No big deals, no media stars, no superstars, sports stars, religious stars, world-type stars, no prominent headlines. I look at those names and I think of some people. I think of my mom and I think of my dad. And I think of one of the pastors in the history of this church, Pastor Risk who had an amazing influence on my life. I think back to names like Louise Naimi and Dwight and Clara Brainerd and Bernice Clone and Marlene Reiki and Bill James and Oscar Flagstead. Some you may recognize, some you may not. Many were my Sunday school teachers and kids' church leaders and leaders in the church, givers of the Christmas promise. I have a list of names in my life who faithfully held out the message of Jesus Christ to me. You have a list of names too, don't you? The ones who told you the Christmas story? The ones who bore the promise to you? You can look at the person to your right, to your left, and back, or in front of you. Abiod, Eliakim, Zadok, Eliud. Eliezer, right here in this church this morning, celebrating the Christmas story carried on by generations of men and women of all sorts, you included. We heard the promise, didn't we, from someone who got it from someone, who saw it from someone, who knew it through someone, who grasped it from someone, who caught it from someone. Where does the Christmas story with all of its promise, all of its hope, all of its peace start? According to Matthew, it starts right here with Abraham. And incredibly, it moves through imposters and prostitutes and chiselers and adulterers and murderers. And it's carried on through monarchs and slaves and aliens and churches. It's born on the anonymous uh, John Doe's of this life. And I don't know who you identify in this incredible procession of people. But one thing I do know, many of you have heard the Christmas story. You've been embraced by its truth. You've been embraced by its love. And you've been renewed and restored by its forgiveness. And you've been included in its peace. And you've been included in its everlasting life. And you've been inspired by its promises. Friends, where does the Christmas story start today? 
I'm telling you right now, it starts with you. See, the question is, will it continue? I guess that's up to you and that's up to me. Up to this church and any other church that will call Jesus Christ Lord. Will you let the light of Jesus Christ shine out in, in your life? Will you let the fragrance and the aroma of Jesus Christ come out of you? Will you share Jesus with the helpless and the hopeless, with the lost and the dying in this world? Maybe you sit here today and, and you don't have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christmas can start for you this morning with all of its meaning. Your hope, the hope of all mankind. Anything you could possibly hope for is there in a relationship. And that relationship is with Jesus Christ. If you'll give your life to him. Your hope and my hope because of our relationship, amen, with Jesus Christ. You look at Matthew chapter 1, and all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. Behold, a virgin will be with child, and she'll give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. What does it mean? What does it mean? God with us. Is he with you today? If not, the Bible says he stands at the door of your heart and he's knocking and saying, if you'll open the door and let me in, I'll come in and I'll fellowship with you. I'll forgive your sins. I'll save you and we can have a relationship together. If you've drifted off and you've lost hope for a whole lot of things, he's knocking at your heart's door this morning too and saying, there's always a starting over with Jesus Christ. And aren't you glad of that this morning? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for that promise. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. And he'll communicate with you. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Christmas story. Would you bow your heads this morning? We come to a close in the service. And I know your pastor, and I do too, when I speak in our own church or other churches. I don't close the service without giving an opportunity for anyone who may not have said yes, is on the outside of a relationship with Christ, but desires to ask him into their hearts today. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask just in a moment for you to raise your hand, and I'll just pray for you in closing. It's not hard to get saved. We just have to recognize that we need a Savior. And I can't save myself. That The gift of eternal life is, is the greatest gift that could ever be given to someone. And I want to receive that gift, and you want to receive that gift. If you haven't made that choice, you'd like to start that Christmas story and relationship today, I'm just going to ask just first, just for a few moments until I see it, and I'll ask you to put it down. Just raise your hand and say, Pastor, would, just, would you pray for me before you close the service? And I'd be happy to do that. I'll just wait for just a few moments. I'm not going to prolong this. Just if you want to give your heart to Jesus, this is the time to do it. I'm going to say, Pastor, I'm really struggling in these days. This COVID thing, relationships, I feel lonely. I feel isolated. Christmas stories seem so far away from me. I need a renewed sense of joy in my heart about what it means to love Jesus and have him in my heart. Maybe this is a good season to do that. You'd like me to pray for you. I'm going to do that. You don't even need to raise your hand. That's why I'm going to close the service this morning. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the word of God, which ministers to us and, and tells the story to us. Thank you, Lord, that you called and used people just like us to be carriers and couriers of the hope, the truth of Christmas. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this earth, for being born in humble circumstances, virgin, for preaching the kingdom of God, for dying on the cross and taking our sins upon yourself 
for rising out of that grave and ascending to heaven where the Bible says, even now you make intercession for us, how powerful that is. Lord, I pray for each one that's here this morning. I don't know their circumstances, but you do. And I pray, Lord, that you look into each heart and just pour in a renewed sense of hope today, a renewed sense of joy, a renewed sense of peace, a renewed sense of trust. Lord, that you are in control of all things that are happening, even when it doesn't seem like it. And Lord, the word declares that you will work all things together for our good and also for your glory. And I pray for Green Bay first, for Pastor Matt and Kyle and their family, the leaders, the elders the, of this church, those who are part of this church, Lord, that you continue to use. And Lord, let it be, continue to be a lighthouse for people who are lost to see light and come and receive Jesus Christ and receive love and receive fellowship amongst the believers. So Father, for each one here this morning, for every circumstance that is represented in their life, I take every detail of their lives and place it right in the center of your awesome and amazing hands. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, can you say amen, church? Amen, amen. I could close with a song, but you wouldn't like that. So I'm just going to say you have an amazing, wonderful day. God bless you. Thank you for being such a great, great congregation.